I added WASD player controls to my top-down PvP sword fighting action game. In this video, I'll share how I implemented smooth 8-directional movement in JavaScript with 3.js and React, how I'm learning 3D modeling and animation because I don't plan to use these free assets for the final version of my game, and what I'll do to build on today's first draft of the movement system. And just like last time, there's a playtest for you to check out in the description. Last episode, I shared how I built and optimized a procedural hex grid system, and I promised you that today's playtest would include the updated hexagon tiles with optimized geometry, which we talked about but didn't include in the last demo. To update the hex grid with these new tiles, we need to get the 3D model from Blender into our 3D scene. Blender and 3.js support the GLTF format, so we export the hexagon as a GLTF file from Blender, put it in our project's public folder, and add it in React 3 Fiber with the use GLTF hook from Dry. Today, we'll use that same import-export process to load characters and animations we get from Mixamo, which is a great resource that gives you free access to models and animations you can use for prototyping. It's completely free to use, and I highly recommend it, especially if you're like me and don't want to work on 3D modeling and animation before some of the core gameplay systems are in place. So Mixamo gives us exports in FBX instead of GLTF, which I believe is a format used commonly in Unity and Unreal. This means that we'll use the use FBX hook instead of use GLTF. And again, the process for us is exactly the same as working with GLTF. But before diving into the code, let's find some characters and animations for prototyping our movement system. Welcome. This is episode two of my devlog series on making a game incrementally, where you can playtest every step of development. Subscribe to get the next episode, and now let's see what we can find on Mixamo. On the Mixamo website, you can download characters and animations. You can also upload your own character and apply animations to it. For my purposes, I'm going to download the Xbot and Ybot character models because I want neutral female and male figures in my scene. Click Download, keep FBX selected, and make sure the pose is set to T-Pose before clicking Download, which you'll need a free account for. Next, let's find some animations. We need animations for each of the eight directions of movement we want to support. Enter Locomotion Pack in the search bar to get animation sets that work well together. These include forward and backward running, left and right strafing, and some additional ones like walking, turning, and idle. I downloaded a couple of these and mixed them with the jog diagonal animations you see here. Now, I didn't like the diagonal jog forward animations, so I decided to only keep the backward ones, and repurposed the forward run instead to get the forward diagonals. More on that shortly. When downloading these animations, select without skin and no character while leaving the other settings at their defaults. FBX format, 30 frames per second, and no keyframe reduction. Next, open the forward run animation in Blender. Remember, we want to generate diagonals to complete our set of eight animations. In Blender, click Import FBX. Once you have the animation open, select it in Object Mode and rotate it on the Z axis by 45 degrees. And because of a quirk with the FBX exporter, or because I didn't look into all of the different export settings, you'll also want to rotate it on the X axis by minus 90 degrees. Lastly, export and save the animation before repeating the process by rotating on the Z axis in the other direction by minus 45 degrees. We now have our forward diagonals. Now that we have our models and animations, let's set up our player controller in code. My goal today is to place two characters at the center of the grid facing each other and to give us the ability to move them around one at a time. And above the active character, I want to display a label to make it clear which one is selected. The player component loads the X or Y bot FBX file and has a position and rotation set to initial values defined here. I also set the scale to 0.1 because by default, the model is very large. Rendering the component gives us the two models facing each other in T-Pose. Next, we add an option in the controls for selecting a model and retrieve the state value for the currently selected model in the label component. This is a billboarded HTML div, which means that it always faces the camera. Its position is set to that of the current model with an offset to place it slightly higher above the head. I use the same logic to make a subtle change to the lighting to emphasize the active model and to de-emphasize the inactive one. 
Next, I load the animations for each of the eight directions of movement we downloaded from Mixamo and edited in Blender. For this demo, I load each animation individually, but don't copy this code. When I replace these with my own animations, I'll combine them into a single file, which you can do in both GLTF and FBX. I also process the animations to remove root motion so that the models animate in place instead of changing position as the animation plays. Blender seems to have added some animation tracks to the forward diagonal run animations that don't exist on the forward run animation they're based on. This probably has something to do with why we needed to add a minus 90 degree x-axis rotation, and I ignore them because they reference parts on our model armature that don't actually exist. I've never noticed issues like this with GLTF, so I'm guessing these issues are specific to dealing with FBX and Blender, or perhaps the animations from Mixamo. Let me know in the comments if you know more. Speaking of issues, Dry provides a use animations hook, but when I tried to crossfade between run animations in different directions for a smoother experience, I got a T-post flash during the interpolation process that I couldn't get rid of, and that's why we're setting up the 3JS animation mixer manually. Set the default post to idle and set up crossfading, and now we can link these animations to player movement. We get the absolute direction based on which WASD or arrow key is pressed, and we use the model's rotation value to compute local direction based on which way the model is facing. Based on the degree of local forward, backward, sideways, or diagonal movement, we select the appropriate animation. Then, we set the speed or amount of distance covered, and I choose to make backward motion slower than forward motion. Now we have eight directional movement with crossfading between different animation states to blend smoothly between them. Not bad. As you can see, the code is a little messy, but that's because it'll be replaced. Keep in mind our hex grid. I've also organized the messy code neatly behind the use player controls and use player animations hooks in order to make it simple to replace their implementations. As a reminder, these models and animations are just for prototyping, and I don't plan to use them in the final version of my game. And this means that before the foundation of my combat system is in place, I'll need to get a little bit better at modeling an animation. I got my first taste of Blender from Bruno Simon's course 3JS Journey, but I've also been learning from free content on YouTube since then. I've linked the channels that I've personally found helpful in case you're interested in the topic as well. As for animation, I learned some art fundamentals with some books on drawing and picked up a few on animation as well, including The Animator's Survival Guide, The Illusion of Life from Disney Animation, and a few more from artists in the anime industry. I don't have an art background, so learning the very basics of gesture drawing and shape design, in addition to how special effects like foliage or water droplets are animated, have been really helpful for me in brainstorming character and asset designs. My thought is that learning these fundamentals will help me define a stylized look for my game that I can pull off even with my limited experience in these topics. That's the theory side, but I need to actually animate the 3D models after I design and pose them, which is a skill that takes years to perfect. Instead of doing things fully manually, I'll be using software called Cascadeur, which simplifies animation by simulating physics when moving limbs and by doing interpolation in between keyframed poses. I learned about this app through Tessellator's video, and Cascadeur has a free version along with tutorial videos that I'm using to learn the basics of the software before purchasing it. Okay, back to the game. So we've made some progress and we now have smooth 8-directional movement with animation blending but our character controller is still incomplete, and there are three problems with this initial implementation. But before I explain these three points and how I'm going to address them, don't forget to subscribe to get my devlogs, and check out the playtest linked in the description so you can try it yourself. If you'd like to support me further, I'll be launching channel memberships once we have a thousand subscribers, in addition to a Patreon page available now which will give you access to the full source code and 3D assets for today's playtest, early access to future playtests, my Discord server, and exclusive items in the PvP swordfighting action game I'm building for anyone who backs me all the way to launch. So the three points that need to be addressed are that 1. The characters are always facing the same direction, so they don't change orientation based on our cursor position. 2. There are no controls for touchscreens, so we can't move these characters on our smartphones. 3. The characters have no interaction with the procedural grid system that we created last time. 
Next episode, I'll be addressing the first two issues by adding cursor based rotation to the characters and implementing joystick controls for touch devices. The third point on integrating our characters in Cartesian space with our hex grid's cube coordinate system is a larger and very interesting topic that I'll address in its own episode following the next one. See you next time.